Competition is kind of silly at its core, right? I mean, think about it. We've made up these games and given them arbitrary rules. And for some reason, as a collective in society, we've decided that the game where we kick a ball at each other is worth more than the game where we stick a pole between our legs and throw a ball at each other. But yet, often the worlds of sports and esports are perceived and presented as a fantastical story of champions fighting for their dreams in what some would make you think had their lives on the line. Stories of gods who have ruled their land for years, and stories of the impossible becoming possible. But we get wrapped up in these thoughts of grandeur and forget that in the end, these people are just people. And these games we play are just games. But one competitor in Melee's history, whether it was intentional or not, reminded people of just that fact. And at the same time, cemented himself into the history books of Melee as its biggest anomaly. <laughs> Crush was a Falco main turned Fox who started playing the game around 2011. Possibly an important detail, as this was before Melee's big resurgence in 2013, in what was a fairly slow time for Melee without all the hype and esports bought from the documentary and the rejoining of Evo. Liquipedia states that Crush comes from Massachusetts, and I say it like that because I want to preface this video in that I did not know Crush personally. Anything I say about him is just pure assumption. And if I get any facts wrong, feel free to correct me and I'll pin a comment with any potential corrections down below. Crush started to break out in Melee in 2015, where he got a nice top 64 at EVO and top 32 at Super Smash Con. End of the year, ranked 3rd in his region and 96th on the world ranking. From here, it was all in the up and up. Within the year, he was able to get wins on players like Face Roll and a young Zane, moving him further up the world rankings. Then, 2017 is where he would really stake his claim as one of the best in the world. Wins over players like Hugs, Pew Pew Yu, Armsa, and Plop would shoot him to 15 on the world rankings. And he would stay consistent as well, getting a top 8 finish at EGLX in the following year, putting him at 12th on the 2018 summer rankings. Crush was on a tear in the world of Melee. His extremely clean fox looked so full of potential that people just couldn't wait to see what the latter half of his year would look like. Except, after winning an event called Gemini, he would take this interview for i didn't sleep a lot last night because i had to i decided yesterday to come to this so i mm. took a bus here actually i think i'm done with this interview you're already done yeah i'm i like i have this thing where i can only talk about myself for like three minutes a day i'm sorry man <laughs> like i just realized like i can't do this anymore <laughs> thank you though great games everyone This would be the last interview Crush would ever take, as he entered four more tournaments after this in the following month, only to then disappear from the competitive melee scene without a trace. What happened to Crush? Why leave after making such an impact that I've really only touched the surface of so far? This is what I want to talk about today, and explain why this was quite possibly the most Crush thing that Crush could have ever done. You see, while you may think that Crush's melee skill is what made him such a memorable player, you couldn't be more wrong. Well, I, I mean, I guess you could be more wrong, you could have said he was president or something, but, but of course, the skill was a, was, a, was a part of it. People were drawn to good players. However, what set Crush apart was his personality. It's hard to put Crush into words, but today I'm, I'm gonna try. Crush was weird, right? Whether this persona he had on while at melee events was the real him or not, I'll never know, 
but he was extremely dry on the surface, almost uncaring about what was happening. Fastbat had a three, one, three to one stock lead and jumped off uh, on his like first to last stock with a down air, and it felt like at that moment you came alive and went for his throat. Did I? We won. Pulling such classics as hosting an AMA on Reddit and only answering one question with a one word answer. Regularly just dipping out of spots that other players would try to stick around in as long as they could. For example, the Sonic Couch. Crush was often seen with this almost classic celebrity persona. Almost as if he was too good for the Smash scene. He didn't need any extra attention, he was just there to do him. But while him not caring obviously wasn't the case, I mean, I doubt you put that many hours into something you don't care about that isn't called your maths homework. And he showed a genuine knowledge and excitement about the game that you could see sometimes in flashes. Yeah, you had some like 80-90% punishes. Yeah, yeah, we both. I don't know if his DI is bad. Or he tends to survival DI, which uh, mm -hmm. you can DI however you want with Falcon, I feel like. And you'll still you die. Live. Well, you either die or you live forever. That is, yeah, that is kind of. Yeah. This dryness wasn't also out of him being uninteresting, though. Crush was genuinely a very funny guy. Uh, so Mango, I actually didn't know who he was, or I barely knew who he was, and I'm like, all right, this guy's got okay shield pressure, so I'm gonna shine out a shield against him. It worked decently well, but after the set, I saw on his Spotify playlist that he had Next to You by Mike Jones as, like, one of his most played songs on Spotify. Do you think that gave him the edge? Not that it gave him the edge, but it made me, like, I don't know. I kind of understand the game better. I understand his play style. And in nowhere was this reflected more than his legendary Twitter account, which unfortunately was deleted upon his retirement and was not archived in any easily accessible way. What you're seeing now is all I could get from the Wayback Machine. His Twitter was probably one of the things that gained him the most popularity, often using it to take shots at the wider melee scene and also make comments on it, as well as some pretty damn funny tweets as well. It's a crime that these aren't kept, so please, if any of you have any of these tweets saved in discords or screenshots, just share an album link in the comments and we can start compiling them, because I mean, it's a crime that there isn't like a community album of these. And while you're there, drop a sub. I mean, it would be crushing if you didn't. But in hindsight, what made Crush stand out so much from the crowd wasn't his Twitter or his dry humour. It was just how much of a breath of fresh air he was in comparison to his counterparts. You see, the late 2010s Melee was a different time to nowadays in its rough esports environment where even the best player in the world is struggling to nail down a sponsor. Back then everyone was thriving and trying their best to make Melee a thing that you could do as your main and only job. Becoming a big esport was the main goal for everyone in the top of the game. In fact, Actually, everyone in the top 20 in 2018 actually had a sponsor, except for Crush. In fact, Crush's one and only sponsor in his career was during the year of 2017 and was a small Smash streaming channel called EGTV, which I can't imagine did more than help him to get out to events. I highly doubt that's because he couldn't get a big sponsor either. As I said, everyone had one, and are you telling me that a sponsor wouldn't be jumping in early to get in on a new, high potential player with just so much more social media standing than his counterparts? It was scary? No, I mean, there's no way Crush wasn't getting offers from teams to sign him. So, why didn't he have a sponsor? Well, to make this video, I, I watched as many clips of Crush talking as I could. Not really a chore, I know. But I just got the feeling that he wasn't in it for the long run from the beginning. He didn't seem interested in that top player lifestyle or making Melee his job. Can I ask you about the summit? Yeah. How do you feel about the summit? I feel nothing. Well, there you have it. So you may ask, why did he get so good to be ranked as the top 12 in the whole world? That's something that only really someone shooting for the top would be able to accomplish, you might say. And I mean, you're right. But I don't think shooting for the top and wanting it to be your job necessarily have to go hand in hand. Crush was clearly the type of person to try to be the best at whatever he was doing. I mean, he won 13 Dragon Duels for crying out loud, which was an old under 13 section of Yu-Gi-Oh! Nationals. How many Dragon Duels have you actually won? 14. You won 14? That's more than anyone else, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. By far. I mean, I only ever top 8 those, and I was religiously obsessed with that game as a kid. 
He also traveled for the game as a kid, even going as far as going to Japan. If you actually watch his interview after the Dragon Duel, the guy doing the interview clearly expresses some excitement about him going into the adult group of Yu-Gi-Oh! Nationals and what he might be able to achieve with his future in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! So we're probably going to expect you in the top of uh, several events in the near future, isn't it? Much like the hype expressed around him in Melee at the time. However, just like with Melee, Crush just seemed to stop playing Yu-Gi-Oh! competitively. I can't find any photos or deck profiles of his from Yu-Gi-Oh! Nationals in the past. I can only assume that maybe he found Melee and got enamored with the game and eventually just stopped competing in Yu-Gi-Oh! because of Melee. So this shows that Crush is clearly just the type of person that wants to be as good as he can at his current interest. But he's also totally fine with moving on when he wants to. Anyway, this is kind of getting a bit armchair psychologist-y, so where was I? Oh yeah, this is what made him a breath of fresh air to a Melee audience. Someone who put on the air of a celebrity above and uninterested in the esports world of Melee, who in reality had that persona maybe have a bit of truth to it. In that, he just wanted to be himself, and just wanted to play in the way that he wanted. To someone never getting caught up in the grandeur of being a pro, and just someone who saw the game for what it was. A game he really, really liked, and a community of people he enjoyed interacting with. In his interview after winning Holiday Bash, Crush said this. Uh, I feel like I kind of like embody the spirit of Melee pretty much. I like that. And honestly, that sums up perfectly. If his retirement proves anything at all, it's that Melee was all he saw. He didn't care about making it his living, and he was playing for what he believed the game was and expressed himself through it, whether that was hating Captain Falcon. Yeah, Falcon's just stupid. Falcon's like the dumbest yeah. character in the game. Wanting to absolutely humiliate the Ice Climbers. <laughs> Yo. That's, a little, that's a little much, dude. Or just pull out the best melee that he could. Oh, he's dead. Yeah. Wow. The An fun. answer from Crush. Crush just did what he believed in all the way through to the end. And when he was done, he left in the most Crush way possible. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> like, I just realized, like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Thank you, though. Great games, everyone. And honestly, this isn't something we've really ever seen since from a high-profile player. Even Armada still talks about Melee and interacts with the community sometimes. So I think that this being the finishing chapter on his career really summed up what made Crush Melee's biggest anomaly. Mm -hmm.